Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Countdown right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. My name is Nita Chai. The markets are doing a completely different, uh, charting a completely different course than what most people would have anticipated this time around yesterday or the early morning today as well. Look at this upsurge that has come in to the markets. And mind you, this is not necessarily bank-led. So it's not one high beta, high weightage pocket which is driving the index higher because banks are up, yes, but they are pretty, they are up in almost the same vein as the Nifty is. The Nifty bank is just about 0.6 or 0.7 percent higher. So uh, it's, it's a good move. It's happened in the last half an hour to 45 minutes of trade in a meaningful way and it's continuing. Um, just bring up uh, the India VIX once and bring up the broader of the spectrum once, the advanced decline ratio uh, to just see what's happening here. No, not much change in volatility. Uh, but the market breadth would be the other interesting one because it had capitulated yesterday. In today's session, a bit of a narrowing down, almost coming down to even Stevens. Let's see if this happens. Remember yesterday, a couple of experts on the on the show had spoken about how we looked a bit oversold and whatever the reasons, maybe maybe there could be a bit of bounce. It's happening for now. Let's sit and watch if this lasts. We are bouncing off essentially the 100 day moving average for the Nifty. Uh, bring up the heat map and show what's happening and what's not on the large caps. Uh, are there losers? Yes. Technology which looked like a safe haven and how people might migrate towards it if indeed this were to turn for the worse has suddenly turned around and almost all the stocks are down in the red. All the five Nifty 50 names are lower in the session. Infosys 2 right down here at about 1.3%. But otherwise, all four others are amongst the top losers. Bajaj Finance ahead of the numbers day after is also trading in the red. What's trading well is high beta. So India Bulls Housing Finance up about 5%. Bharti Airtel now. Um, you could argue whether this is because the market might assume that a scrapping of the 299 plan is an indication of what telcos are now trying to do. I don't quite have a handle there, but it's up about 5%. Sun Pharma, 4%. Vedanta, about 4%. And Ultratech Cement has gained about 25 to ITC, by the way. Mind you, the numbers in the detailing, some detailing coming out post-market hours, that stock too is about 2.5%. But the main um, I item, Devina, uh, on the large cap front at least is Reliance two and a half percent higher. So large caps are doing a more bit. Uh, the broader markets maybe could have done a bit better. Could have, yes. And uh, not to say that they're not in the green, but there is that tinge of underperformance there within the broader market space. Though the high beta names and the ones that have been completely thrashed over the last few days have uh, surmounted in today's session. So you've got the likes of Divan Housing Finance and then the others that played it down a bit like a Delta Corp that saw that big slash of 13% yesterday. That has picked up momentum in today's session. So uh, those are some of the few stocks that you need to keep an eye out on. Uh, this is uh, what the um, uh, mid-cap uh, index looks like right now. So about a third of a percent higher for the index. Adani Power stacks up to all that are about six and a half percent higher. Divan Housing Finance, that's up a six and a half percent. IDBI Bank, Muthut Finance is up about five odd percent in the session. Remember, uh, there is a brokerage you know, that is giving it a price target of about 815 odd rupees. That's a, almost a 50 percent upside from here. Uh, Jindal Sien Power, four, four percent higher. Amongst the losers, Sterlite Tech continues to grind lower. Um, I think 160 odd is where it's currently trading at. Oberoi Realty, uh, saw a decent quarter, saw the reaction to that coming out post its reported numbers and today's session takes a little bit of a breather on the downside. Edelweiss Financial Services, net interest income uh, has dropped this quarter quite significantly, a 42% drop in net interest income. Uh, profits were at 232 odd crores. Graphite India is the other one that's trading under in the session. In the small cap space, you just quickly pull that up as well uh, to see what's uh, what are the moving parts. Delta Corp recovers, though it's not at the high point of the day, the high it was about closer to 11, 11 and a half percent. IRB Infrastructure, DCM, Sriram, IDFC Limited are some of the gainers. Amongst the losers, Jet Airways pummeled yet again. Uh, Karnataka Bank, um, then you've got the likes of um, and EID Parry, Minda Industries looking weak. Uh, two stocks to watch out for, one being uh, uh, a Sarah Sanitary Ware, reported numbers, 38 crores in terms of PAT performance. The stock not doing all that badly actually. One odd percent after dropping initially and the other one is being Polycap. That number is going to come out shortly. You're going to watch out for the first reporting number post its listing. Uh, that stock ahead of numbers is absolutely flat. Had gone up to about 650 now trading at 656. But what's happening in the more liquid universe in the FNO space? Namni joins in with that. Namni. 
Thanks for that, Davina. Well, some respite coming in for the markets. We bounced back from that 100-day moving average. We've tested that level twice now, and some bit of buying or short covering bounce, you can call it. Uh, but both Nifty as well as Bank Nifty futures have seen mild bit of build up in open interest. Important to see whether this lasts towards the end of the day or not. Three percent higher for Nifty futures, and the Bank Nifty futures have seen a build up of almost six and a half percent. But the premium in Bank Nifty futures have definitely gone up by almost 40 to 50 points in the intraday session. Um, uh, for almost 50 percent of the gains, by the way, are right now coming in from your heavyweights like Reliance and ITC, which has gone up in trade. But India Wix continues to be subdued. Uh, that's down almost a percent and a half. In terms of options data, there is some bit of shifting of positions which have just taken place in the last 15 to 20 minutes of trade. Your most active strike so far was 11,200 call and the 11,100 put. And we were seeing some bit of writing actually for the 11,200 call. As of now, it's added about 8 lakh shares but there has been some intraday unwinding. Your maximum open interest on the call side is at the 11,300. If you look at the put side, maximum open interest is at the 11,000 put. But now there's a lot of positions being shifted on the put side. So 11,000 put has added about 14 lakh shares and the uh, 11,100 put strike two has added nearly 13 lakh shares in trade. So we bounced back, but important to see if we can sustain this. And once again, 11,250 will be a crucial mark. If we can cross and sustain that level, there could be some more buying which could come about. In terms of individual stocks, SRF reported good set of numbers, but surprisingly in the morning session there was a gap down opening for this one. Huge recovery seen in the intraday session. The stocks recovered almost 250 points in the intraday session. It is at days high now, 4.5%. Look at the build up on the future side, indicating traders are taking long positions. And even on the cash side, the volumes are pretty much high. That's the AVAT function of the Bloomberg projecting today's volume. That's the white line vis-a-vis -vis the average volume of last 20 days that's been projected on the blue line. Uh, the other one is Manapuram Finance. This one comes out with its numbers tomorrow. But remember, Mutut Finance came out with the numbers, and I don't know if it took cues from there. Six and a half percent long buildup seen ahead of the numbers, so watch out for this counter. And Apollo Tires, that's been quite weak. In fact, that stock's touched its 52 week low, three and a half percent lower. And also on the future side, there has been some shorting, which continues every single day for this counter, currently at about 180 levels. Well, let's get in a market voice. Steve Bandopadi of Indri Trade, JRG Group, joins us right now on the show with his thoughts on what's happening uh, to sentiment currently. Sudeep, it's turned around and turned around quite quickly. Yesterday with the S&P and the Dow and the Nasdaq, more importantly, doing what they're doing, what they were doing then, everybody would have thought that it's a day of uh, se severe wreckage. That hasn't quite happened. We've turned around. Is the market clinging on to any kind of positive news that comes in from the globe or is it the Indian markets which were a bit oversold according to a few people bouncing back on their own? I think uh, Neeraj a combination of both. Uh, look at uh, what happening today uh, in the European markets. I think they are uh, you know pretty stable uh, mildly in the positive zone after they opened. Uh, you know, yes, uh, yesterday was a bad day and uh, the way the uh, trade war between uh, US and China is going, I think, uh, you know, things are looking pretty uh, 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 unpalatable at this stage from an investor point of view. And uh, one is not sure how this is going to get resolved, whether uh, the Trump uh, G meeting at the uh, on the sidelines of G20 meeting uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, the beginning of June, whether that will uh, lead to some kind of uh, kind of reconciliation. Uh, one is not sure. So uncertainty will remain. And remember, this comes on the top of the uh, uh, scenario where the global growth also is definitely slowing down. Yes, uh, the global central banks have been pumping more and more liquidity, and they will probably continue to do that. But the fact remains the global growth has slowed down, and this trade war, which is looking like an all-out trade war, has broken. Uh, as far as India is concerned, we have our set of uh, you know, reasons for volatility. Of course, the election results uh, is round the corner, and there are all kind of views which are being taken. On top of that, I think there is a genuine uh, a slowdown even in Indian consumption, and you know, any sector you pick, and that's pretty visible. Uh, liquidity, the other uh, bug uh, uh, bear for the market. I think there is a significant uh, jamming of liquidity in the system. Uh, you know, different estimates are uh, being thrown, but 
anywhere between 75,000 to uh, 1,000 crore to 100,000 crore is the liquidity shortfall uh, at this stage in the market. That's the view. And with that kind of shortfall, I think there is a significant concern as far as the way the economy will move and the way the markets will move. All right, Siemens reports its Q2 numbers and the numbers are flashing on your screens. The net profit has come in at 280 crores. That is a significant bump up. Revenues have also gone up uh, on a year-on-year -year basis from 219.7 crores of profit. They've come in at 280 odd crores. So the stock has reacted duly and it's a conducive market environment. So uh, if you get a good beat uh, on the numbers, you'll see the stock react positively and that's what's happening with Siemens. We don't have the internals yet, but these are the two uh, numbers that we have at this point, the two, the top line as well as uh, the bottom line growth numbers uh, for Siemens. But um, Sudeep, uh, getting back to the market discussion, I mean, so far we've been talking about, you know, how it's been um, more of the foreign money that's been supportive of the move, at least in the month of April. Month of May looks extremely dicey with the kind of sell-off that we've seen in every single trading day of the month of May. I don't know if today happens to be any different or no. But what would the prudent approach be right now? Hold on to some of the positions in light of the uncertainty globally as well as the challenges that we could face ahead of elections? Well, there are definite challenges both in the global markets as well as domestic market, and we have to be cognizant of that. Uh, you know, liquidity also is a challenge, as I was just mentioning. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you rightly said, the uh, uh, FIIs were positive and they were pouring money into Indian markets, and that pretty much uh, led to the sharp improvement in Indian uh, uh, markets. And the way uh, things are panning out now, FIIs are becoming a bit risk averse. Uh, they are becoming cautious and that doesn't augur well for the liquidity of Indian market as well as the market uh, uh, direction. So one has to be cautious. That definitely uh, uh, would be my advice. On the other hand, uh, there are significant opportunities also which are emerging. So, you know, maybe it's a time for bottom fishing, whether the time is now or another five, seven, 10 days later, one doesn't know. But if you're a long-term investor, I think you can start looking to build your portfolio for the next three, four, five years. Mm. Okay. Uh, so probably not a bad time to start bottom fishing. Sudeep, if you were to advise in terms of uh, fresh allocation in a specific pocket, we've been looking at some of the defensive names, um, you know, getting completely thrashed, be it consumption, uh, be it pharmaceutical names. IT today has taken a knock to the chin. So th with the defensive pocket right now under some amount of stress, where should the new money flow in? A couple of sectors I can talk about and uh, some uh, specific stocks uh, uh, in other pockets. Uh, one sector which I've been bullish and Neeraj knows very well for quite some time. And finally, we are seeing definite green shoots there, and that's the cement. Uh, if you look at the Q4 earnings of the cement companies, by and large, uh, you know, the earnings have been pretty good and they have uh, uh, beaten the expectations. Look, what's, what's happening in cement is last few quarters, the demand uh, was increasing, but the price uh, they were not able to take up uh, and the margins were not improving. And that was the problem with the cement for the last few quarters. This quarter, we are seeing clear signs of margins improving. The companies have taken, by and large, reasonable price hikes. And the way the demand scenario is unfolding, it looks like these price hikes uh, are going to remain and the margin will be sustainable. With this backdrop and with the uh, rea reality that the government needs to start spending in a big way once uh, uh, it's formed, uh, I am pretty hopeful on cement. Valuation-wise, also, they look attractive. And cement companies definitely can be bought into. <coughs> you know, watch out for Siemens. Um, Sudeep was talking about cement, of course, but Siemens uh, quarter two numbers on your screen, we just marked it a while ago. Now we have the segmental numbers out. But in the power and gas segment, which accounts for about 55 to 60% of the previous few quarters uh, revenue and debit numbers, has actually done very well for uh, Siemens. I think those uh, that performance or that segment's performance has actually moved up uh, on a on a YOI basis, and that would probably be one reason why the top line having been okay, but the bottom line numbers look a lot better 
uh, than the top line growth. EBITDA up 27%, so margin expansion in all probability, and then accompanied by the bottom line growth. Margins at 11.55% versus 9.83%. It's a strong show by Siemens, 4.09% now up in trade. You don't normally see such a reaction, but it's definitely it's, um, come out um, on with some fairly decent numbers in the session today. The margins needed from the power and gas, uh, I think they've improved substantially to 16.2 versus 11.9. And the main EBIT contribution, which comes from the energy business, I think there the EBIT has come in at 146 versus 124. Um, yeah, so that's a rise of nearly 18%. And even the EBIT margins from the energy side of the business have improved to almost 10.6 versus 8.4. So these two, I guess, as you mentioned, account for more than more than 50% of their uh, bottom line have done pretty well. I think the new orders order also. Flow. Yeah, new order inflows. The 24% flow jump year on year on the new order inflows have probably given it a whole rounded. Uh, a full rounded uh, a good quarter on probably all of those counts yeah. uh, that we was just mentioning and it keeps going from strength to strength 4.22 now for Siemens. Sudeep Bandopadhyay, any thoughts here? I mean we've been talking about how maybe some of the cap good names could finally make uh, or show some progress uh, after years of talking about this. Uh, any thoughts here on the space and Siemens in particular if you if you just look at the numbers that we just spoke about right now. Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, as you rightly said, Neeraj, we have been all waiting for cap goods sector to finally uh, start delivering and start performing in the market. Unfortunately, uh, because of multiple reasons, that hasn't happened till now. Uh, but this quarter numbers, uh, uh, you know, even if you look at LNT numbers uh, and now Siemens, I think numbers are looking promising. Uh, I will be still a little uh, wary of taking exposure at these levels in both these uh, uh, counters uh, on the back of the fact that you know there have been many many false starts uh, earlier let us see um, you know the the, 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 the uh, government formation and the way the government policies come before I uh, start taking call at these uh, counters also one has to remember the valuations are not uh, really cheap uh, as far as these uh, some of these stocks are concerned uh, they are good companies they will definitely perform over a long period of time but the time to pick up uh, uh, may not have yet come um. Well, the margins this time around have been double digit, 11.5 versus 9.8. And Sudeep, as you mentioned, private capex has been an issue uh, for the industry and not today. I think it's been uh, lacking for the last uh, five to six years. But overall, Sudeep, tell us what is your assessment been uh, with regard to the March quarter earnings, quarter four earnings so far that we've received? By and large, uh, you know, uh, uh, nobody was expecting great uh, March quarter numbers. And I think that's pretty much is getting played out. I would say we have uh, probably been more disappointed than, uh, you know, uh, uh, than uh, we have been, uh, uh, you know, happy with the numbers. There have been uh, sectors, uh, I talked about cement, I think that cement results have been pretty good. Uh, IT, by and large, has been uh, uh, decent uh, uh, earnings uh, as far as the top IT companies are concerned. But overall, uh, the economy is in some kind of stress, and that's pretty much visible uh, the way the uh, entire consumption basket, and remember that has been a significant part of uh, Indian markets. Also, the financials, the NBFCs, the banks, Yes, there are pockets of uh, uh, you know good results, but by and large, there is a stress as far as financial services sector is concerned. There is a stress as far as FMCG and the entire consumption basket is concerned, and these are significant part of the uh, index. So we have to uh, you know realize that you know Q4 was not great, and Q4 was not expected to be great also. Okay, Polycap quarter four numbers on your screens. A dip in net profits at 27.2 odd percent, 137.3 crores versus 188.7 crores on a year-on-year -year basis. I think revenues have come in higher, at 15.8 percent higher this time, at 2,444.8 crores. Uh, so, bottom line, uh, taking a slight bit of a slip, and the stocks uh, seen a cut, but not a very massive cut as such. It's just down about three quarters of a percent. In fact, it's recovering as well. Remember, uh, Polycap uh, uh, listing price was somewhere around uh, 538. It listed. Issue price was 538. It listed at about uh, 624. Went all the way up until 665. Now trading at 650. Um, Going to see. It, 
in each of the segments, how have they done? Because you've got their wires and cable business, which is the chunk of their revenue generator. And then you have the newly entered over the last three years, which has also become an EBITDA positive business for them, which is the fast moving electrical goods business, uh, you know, which is also starting to shape up well for them. Uh, looking at, um, you know, revenues of close to 490 odd cross contribution just from the F FMEG segment. But uh, individually, at least with the top two numbers that we've got so far, uh, the profit numbers seem to have slipped a bit. The stock at 649. Sudeep, uh, uh, you know, you had spoken to us earlier on about um, you know liking a stock called Nosil. Are you still sticking with that? Yeah, absolutely. This is one sector which have been very positive uh, for quite some time. That's the chemicals, specialty chemicals in particular. <clears throat> I believe there is a significant opportunity for Indian uh, specialty chemical manufacturers in today's uh, uh, you know, overall global economic context. Uh, US and the European countries definitely want to put some kind of tariff and sanctions on Chinese manufacturers. Now, there are allegations of dumping. Uh, and, and because of that, I think everybody uh, in, 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 in the developed side of the market, US and Europe, are trying to develop alternate sources of supply. And India figures very prominently in their list. In that context, one has to look at Nosil and other specialty chemical companies. Nosil is into rubber chemicals. It's a very uh, closely guarded technology. They have about 50% of the domestic market and 5% of the world market at this stage. Uh, the opportunity for them is to scale up that world market share significantly from here on. And the way things are uh, you know, happening between US and China, I'm pretty confident that they have an excellent opportunity of garnering more and more market share in the international uh, uh, market uh, you know valuation wise it looks pretty attractive and we, we believe that it can move up about 30 percent plus from here within one year uh, also remember that margins as far as nocil is concerned is improving and domestic business also is very robust and it's expected to continue to grow uh, uh, you know in the near future hmm. steep i don't know if i missed up what sort of upside are you expecting on this one Well, we are expecting uh, uh, about 200 bucks price from Nosil uh, in about uh, a year's time, and uh, you know that should give a significant, uh, you know, uh, up, up, upside for the investor if he's investing at current levels. It's at 122, and upside expected above 200 till 200 as well. So, Deep, appreciate you joining us today and taking us through your views on the markets. Have a great day. Okay, that was Sudeep Bandhubadhyay giving his top pick in the market. That's Nossal and also he's not too enthused with the March quarter earnings. But markets, by the way, are at days high. We've, we've surpassed that level of 11 to 50 as well. It's very important to see if we can sustain this towards the end. And 115 points higher for Nifty. Remember, majority of the gains that you're seeing today are coming in from your biggies, Reliance Industries, as well as ITC, which have gone up in trade today. 3% higher for Reliance Industries, 36 rupees higher. And ITC up almost 2% after tumbling. Uh, the numbers came in yesterday, but the brokerages gave a thumbs up. The volume growth came bang in line with the street was expecting. Okay, on to some macro... Sorry, you're saying something? If you do mark Bharti, because no, that's not the yet. other one. For sure, I mean, we can mark. Yeah, pull up Bharti Airtel. 6% higher. And that's a massive move, 5.88%. Uh, I was just talking to Somit. At this, I, 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 I don't know if the street is excited because of that discontinuation of the 299 plan. Uh, but postpaid as a percentage of revenues anyway is not too much. And this was uh, not a plan that was generating too much of revenue. Again, I don't know, need if uh, we can even say with conviction whether this is one uh, reason this one action which indicates bottoming out of pricing because that is not in the hands of Bharti Airtel or Vodafone area that we all know is in the hands of Reliance Geo. So the street has gotten excited today. Don't know how long this excitement will last. But uh, let's move on and on to inflation numbers. Yep, let's move on to some macro news then. Wholesale price inflation moderated marginally in the month of April, while the retail inflation jumped to a six-month high, even as food prices rose from unusually low levels. Subdued demand reflected on core inflation this time around. Pallavi Nahata brings us more details on that. WPI inflation moderated in April to 3.07% in line with analyst expectations. Inflation in March came in at 
WPI, which tracks changes in the price of goods in stages before the retail level, saw a rise in the price of primary articles by 3.3%. Food articles and non-food articles, which constitute primary articles, both rose. Minerals rose by 5.3%, while fuel and power declined by 0.5%. Manufactured articles, which is an indication of demand, was completely flat. Retail inflation, on the other hand, was at a six-month high in April at 2.9%. Low inflation in the last financial year was driven by food prices. But core inflation, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, had remained high. The trend has now seen a reversal. Inflation in food and beverages was at a nine-month high of 1.3% on account of rising prices. Economists expect the upward momentum in fruits and vegetables to sustain over the coming months. Core inflation dipped to an 18-month low of 4.55%, reflecting weak demand in the economy. Even though headline inflation is rising, the Monetary Policy Committee will still see room for lowering rates when it meets next month. Weakness in growth indicators such as the Purchasing Managers Index and the Index of Industrial Production may strengthen the case for a third rate cut this year, despite uncertainty over its timing. All right, uh, that is uh, a quick take on the WPI numbers coming at 3.02 percent. SRF Industries has seen its profit jump by more than 50 percent in the fourth quarter. The country's largest chemical manufacturer also saw its margins improve, making it the stock to watch out for in intraday trade. In fact, if you see it had gone down almost 3 percent from there, it's now come to 4 percent. So an intraday swing of about 7 to 8 percent. Yash Upadhyay, he's here to tell us what's worked out for this particular counter. Yash. Well, that's absolutely right, Devina. It has been a roller coaster ride for SRF today. It opened gap down and went on to fall as much as five, five and a half percent to now up a four, positive uh, about four, four and a half percent. Despite the fact that the numbers weren't that bad on a year-on-year -year basis, their revenues have grown about twenty-eight and a half percent to two thousand seventy-two crore rupees, a fifty-four percent jump in net profit to one hundred and ninety-one crores. EBITDA came in slightly lower to the Bloomberg estimate of four hundred and two crores, so it was at about three hundred and eighty-nine crores, and margins to slightly lower, about 18.8 percent versus estimate of 19.2 percent. Now, this was aided uh, because of the strong growth in the chemical business segment, which reported a 66 percent jump in revenues on a year-on-year -year basis, coming in at about 840 crore rupees, uh, aided partially by the higher sales of chloromethane segment, as well as strong growth uh, seen in the agrochemical segment, something that the, comp uh, that the management had been guiding for over the last several quarters. Uh, the te technical, te the packaging and films business, that too saw a good enough growth of about 18 uh, percent aided by the capacity ramp up of its BOPT facility. Uh, technical, uh, technical textiles business didn't do quite well, only about a 4, 4 percent growth, uh, but that was because of the inventory losses in the current quarter. But notwithstanding that, uh, they managed to do well on account of increased sale of the value added products. Margins too were mostly higher for most of the segments, only with the exception of technical textiles, with such margin come down from 14 percent, 14 and a half percent to 11 and a half percent in the fourth quarter. Uh, some of the key highlights and the management commentary uh, to watch out for is the fact that the chemicals business after uh, after three successive quarters uh, showed out uh, performed very well in the fourth quarter uh, the 40 to 50 percent growth in chemicals business was a big boost as well as the fact that the company has entered into an agreement to sell its engineering and plastic business for 320 crore rupees the management in its press release uh, says that the demand on the specialty chemical side uh, seems to be uh, becoming back on track and expect a better year uh, going ahead which would be a key positive because the specialty chemicals business is their uh, flagship high margin uh, business as well. As far as valuations are concerned, the stock has run up quite a bit, but uh, it, on, a, on an FI20 basis, it trades at less than 20 times its estimated EPS and at 10 times its FI20 EV to EBITDA. Having said that, uh, all of the analysts, they have a buy rating with not a single sell rating on the stock, but the return potential, uh, that suggests a negative 0.4% uh, given the kind of run up that we've had of almost 25% on a year-to-date basis.
Okay, Yash, thanks a lot for bringing those details with regard to SRF numbers. Clearly, after a week opening markets, giving a thumbs up to this one, numbers looked good on all parameters this time around. All right, from SRF, moving on to Delta Corp, a stock which has jumped the most in a year after the company clarified that it has not received any notice with regard to any sort of GST evasion. Brokerage US, UBS, pardon me, though, has uh, projected an 82% potential upside on the stock. Nikki Merchandani standing by with more details on that report. Nikki, over to you. All right, Navneet, I'm first going to address the development and that get on to the UBS note, where some of the media reports suggested that the DG GST has booked two Goa companies, including Delta Corp, for rupees 6,189 crore region. Both the companies awaited the GST by camouflaging a mixed supply of services. They have paid GST by artificially splitting values of services. In fact, they allege that the GST was paid on net revenue of a casino instead of face value of the bet. And they said that the government was now in talks with uh, these two companies to recover evaded GST uh a GST where both of these companies was UBS said on Delta Corp was essentially very heartening and also we saw a development on the, the stock reacting on this particular report where it suggested that the tax amount appears to be significant though but then the market seems to have overreacted over the news article uh, it's not even they're not even sure if the article on the news was legitimate for the company and even if it is if even if that's the case the amount could be disputed by the company given the global tax model uh, that is usually been followed by most of the casinos companies and UBS at this point of time uh, sees this and this sees this level as an opportunity to buy and expect the stock to recover as you suggested that they expect the potential upside of more than 82 percent for this counter having said that the stock has recovered in trade almost 13 to 14 percent uptick than from what we've seen in the early deals in the trade so much for putting that into perspective. That's the reason why Delta Corp is doing what it is doing. But global markets doing a lot better than what people would have other year, earlier envisaged. At least Indian markets are doing that. And a strict focus on individual stocks, that's the way to handle uh, the blowout of this US-China trade war. According to Meda Samand of Fidelity International, in a chat with Bloomberg earlier today, she also spoke about how central banks in emerging markets are likely to react to the trade war. Listen in. It's been going on since the middle of last year, this volatility uh, due to what's happening uh, between the U.S. and China. Um, what we've been saying is that uncertainty and uh, short-term sentiment impact is likely to stay. In fact, the cycles are getting shorter and shorter. And, and during a period of such uncertainty, it's really about going back to basics. Uh, you know, so focus on just individual companies which are unlikely to get impacted uh, uh, despite the headwinds that we have and are likely to stay on. There are a number of emerging market economies uh, in the region that uh, stand to suffer some pretty heavy collateral damage from this trade dispute. So does this uh, pretty much uh, bake in uh, more easing from the central banks in those countries? Well, if you look at the rest of Asia, it's really a lot of intra-regional trade between China and ASEAN. Um, and that's an area which, uh, where we thought that things are likely to get impacted. But the ASEAN economies are interesting in the sense that, uh, you know, you have five countries, different led drivers of uh, growth, uh, very not homogenous at all, um, and really huge domestic consumption-oriented economies like Indonesia, where with the elections being washed out, we are, nearly, we are really seeing a new sort of phase starting out. Um, you know, central banks in the rest of Asia have been watching this very carefully. There's plenty of room to loosen or cut interest rates. Um, India is another story where, which is really not dependent on what's happening with respect to the trade side or the export side. Um, once the election cycle gets washed out, uh, we are likely to see sort of that 6-7% growth likely to sustain. Um, and the central bank likely to cut rates again because they, they're more of an inflation watcher and we've just seen food prices going up. Okay, uh, trade war may have spooked the market sentiment for global equities but as of now back home we've seen some bit of recovery at least. Nifty is up around 115 points above the mark of 11,250. Let's bring in some technical voice and then tell you well, how should one position at this point of time. Sachdan and Uthekar of Trade Bulls is here with us. Hi, Sachdan and good afternoon and thanks a lot for joining us. Would you take any fresh bet after we've rebounded from that 100-day moving average currently Nifty is above that mark of 11,250? Well, good afternoon. Uh, 
Certainly, yes. In fact, uh, the overall scenario is improving now. In fact, if you look at uh, the overall, uh, you know, uh, direction uh, for the market has been uh, on the negative side since last eight trading sessions. But if you look at uh, today's formation, you know, it looks like uh, market is looking for a bottom, and probably what we have seen uh, is uh, an early sign of uh, it uh, being is getting established. So, any, uh, in, in fact, we have already seen some run up. So, definitely, you know, on a decline, somewhere close to 11,200 would be a better level wherein uh, some positional trade should be initiated on the long side. The overall stop loss for this particular trade would be placed at around 11,040 on a closing basis. And we are expecting that uh, the recovery which sets in should see a swing towards 11,500. So, from position perspective, I think now uh, the entire scenario has changed and any declines in the market should be utilized to create long positions. 11,040 should be the stop loss on a closing basis for, for the same. Okay, use the dips to create long positions is the advice coming in from Sach Tandan and his target on Nifty in the near term is about 11,500. We've also got Amar Singh of Angel Broking. Hi Amar, good afternoon. Uh, would you concur with Sach Tandan and create long positions on the index? Uh, actually, I would say that uh, uh, we had a buy call uh, in the morning on Bank Nifty around 11 o'clock. So uh, what we were seeing is that uh, after the sharp correction, the uh, the indices were trading uh, close to very crucial support zones and and also uh, there is a possibility and other major stocks in the index also uh, they also trading very close to the support zone so we've seen a, a short covering in the market I would say it's too early to say that uh, we are seeing a trend reversal but yes uh, this being a very uh, strong uh, uh, support level so we've seen a, a short covering and also some buying coming in at lower levels but uh, as far as nifty is concerned I would say that uh, yesterday's high uh, of 11,300 levels, that's going to act as an immediate level of resistance where again we could witness some selling pressure. So higher levels will be sold into because if you look for the last uh, almost four trading sessions, including today, so somewhere around 11,300 and 350, 360 zone, that's a very crucial resistance zone. And technically also uh, the, uh, the index being an oversold, the, uh, this uh, pullback was expected, but I would say that around 11,300, 350, again, we'll witness selling pressure. So I would say that rather uh, at higher levels, one can look at going short. Yes, uh, today's uh, uh, support uh, of 11,100, now that should act as a very crucial support zone, but uh, higher levels will definitely be sold into. The same would also apply uh, for Bank Nifty. If you look at Bank Nifty in particular, uh, Bank Nifty now has got uh, resistance coming at around 29,200, 250 levels, and uh, whereas on the downside, again, support is, uh, is uh, if you look at 28,600 odd levels. So we'll see some uh, volatility around this range and uh, high levels will uh, will be sold into the market. Okay. All right. Specific stocks. Um, Amal, to you first. Yeah. Uh, the first one uh, we're looking at is uh, Titan. Uh, this is one stock, if you look at it, uh, in spite of uh, the sharp uh, sell-off which we've uh, witnessed in the indices, uh, uh, Titan is one which is really uh, holding strong. And uh, if you look at it technically across uh, various time frames with the monthly charts, the weekly charts, uh, but they continue to remain uh, positive. And uh, on the short term charts also, what we are seeing is that the stock did correct. We, it witnessed, uh, came down as low as 1080. Again, it's currently trading around 1150 levels. So this is one stock one can look at uh, Titan. So any pullback towards 1130, 1135 ideally can be a good level to buy uh, Titan with a stop loss of uh, 1116 and a target of 11.79 on the upside. So that's uh, one on the long side. On the short side, one can look at Exide. Uh, Exide is a stock which uh, continues to grind lower. And uh, what we're seeing on the charts is that even the daily charts, the stock uh, uh, has managed to bounce back today, but that's only a very uh, minuscule bounce to say. And uh, technically, if you look at the long-term charts, uh, the intermediate term as well as the short term, they, they continue to display that the stock will be sold at higher levels. So, any pullback in this stock can be used as a shorting opportunity. Ideally, 208, 209 levels can be used as a shorting opportunity with a stop loss of 214.2 and a target of 195 on the downside. All right. Uh, Sajitana, what about your stock ideas? Well, I have three uh, stock recommendations, two on the long side and one on the short side. Uh, talking about the long positions, uh, first one is ICSA Bank. So, if you can recollect, uh, we had a sell opinion in ICSA Bank last week around 205 levels. The pattern target for the same was around 380 and I think that particular 
move has been uh, you know uh, has pan out in the in a very well managed phase and the way uh, uh, the positions are getting uh, you know skewed in right now i feel that uh, 375 should be the stop loss for the trade and again we may see a rebound back to 400 405 levels in icici bank so this is one particular counter that should be uh, utilized uh, for build, uh, building some long positions fresh longs and britannia on the other uh, other hand uh, has seen a very steady uh, recovery in fact what we are seeing on the weekly charts is a double bottom kind of a formation the stop loss for the trade should be placed at 27 7 26 70 and we are expecting a rebound back to 28.40 where its uh, 20 day exponential moving average is placed. So uh, Britannia and ICICI Bank would be on the long side. On the short side, uh, you know, Jubilant Foods has been on the weakening side and in fact uh, what we have seen in last three trading sessions is again a continuation pattern on the bearish side which indicates a price target somewhere close to 11.75. Uh, any uh, up move should be utilized to create short positions. The the stop loss on the future should be placed around 12.66 and uh, this particular uh, counter should be utilized uh, uh, when we are considering any short positions. All right. Uh, those are some stock ideas from Sachitanand Thikkar as well as Amar Singh. Bringing in Rahul Arora of Nirmar Bang. He's joining us on the show this afternoon. Rahul, very good afternoon to you. Um, it has been a fairly volatile period over the last uh, few days. This month particularly has not started off on the right foot. Uh, global tensions, uh, domestic uncertainty of the election, call it what you may, but equity and market investors have taken the brunt of it. What would the position be now? So uh, I think it's best to probably sit on cash, uh, at least till the election verdict comes out, because I'm not sure how much of what you're seeing in the market since the fall of 11,800 has to do with the expectation of the election outcome. I think it's probably more, global. at least 80 to 90 percent, if not more, is because of what's happening with the trade war between. Yeah. Uh, the US and China. So I think you know the market will probably start pricing in the exit polls maybe on Friday as we go into the weekend but I think the reaction to elections if any will be next week. Given all of this uncertainty I think it's probably best to sit uh, on the sidelines because you know you had a euphoric rally that took it to 11,800 in the first place but I think it was a very good reality check to come down to 11,100 to just tell people that you know nothing in life is linear. So I think to that extent, and the earnings haven't been anything to cry off the roof from. Yeah. or rather Which so actually say. brings me to my second point, that it questions the earning predictability and the forecast that we're making for FI20, because when you talk about numbers of 17, 18, 19 times, that comes into question mark. It does, and but uh, you know, um, I think there is there are a few things that are sort of happening simultaneously. You know, one is of course the importance of the BFSI sector in India, which mm -hmm. the regulators are now taking note of. The fact that it's 38, 39 percent of the index and how they can sort of look to tweak that on the lower side. So if that was to happen, you'll see a lot of portfolio churn if and when that happens. Uh, the second part is there has been a marked slowdown in consumption in India and that's been reflected in a lot of the FMCG as yeah. well as the automobile stocks and con converse concurrently in the auto, auto ancillary names as well. So I think there's been a little bit of a valuation reset over there. Uh, I don't think interest rates is the solution uh, to anything in India right now because I think uh, you know we're talking about manufacturing on one side and jobs on the other and I don't think another 25 basis point rate card even if you get it in June is going to spur up anything dramatically. So I think uh, earnings are probably going to be in for a slightly more protracted muted period of time than was earlier envisaged mm. uh, and coupled with the global uncertainty because I think you know when you come back to work four or five days after the election verdict it's all going to go back to global any which ways. You're going to digest the news and you're going to move on. So uh, my sense is I would I wouldn't be too surprised if the nifty falls another 500 points from here but I think the fact that the cash levels of the DIs are anyway so high, I don't think any major fall will be allowed in the market, so to speak. I think it will probably be bought into. So the risk reward is probably getting a little more fa in favorable and going long mm. right now because it's fallen off about seven, 800 points from the high. But till the election outcome, I'd say just wait a bit on the sidelines. Don't try and second guess. What did you make of uh, some of the numbers? Consumption is right up there. By the way, Indian Bank numbers on your screen. Just a moment to take that before we move any further. Net loss numbers versus a profit uh, for Indian Bank. I rec I, we should try and get the asset quality numbers up on the screen. For a lot of these banks, the optical numbers of quarter four bottom lines don't work as much as the asset quality. So we'll try and get that going. The stock is up about 3%. So maybe just maybe the asset quality numbers have turned out a tad bit better. We'll wait for those numbers to come out before we comment more on this. But they just released the numbers and the stock seems to be doing okay. Um, consumption. Uh, we have Westlife numbers 
that have come out. Jubilant comes out tomorrow. Um, starting off with that small bucket and then move on to the other ones in the consumption space. What did you make of Westlife numbers? How does that augur for the QSR space? Uh, so Neeraj, I'm not too perturbed by the overall structural nature of the business. I still think there is immense potential uh, for this business to grow. I think uh, what people need to take into cognizance is the high base effect. Uh, that the SSG growths have had, both for Jubilant as well as for Westlife, the SSG growths had gone on north of 20%. Uh, so obviously there is going to be a bit of base effect that comes in and there is a general slowdown in consumption that is well warranted. I think this quarter should be alright. I think you'll probably see a slightly better number because you had the IPL and then you know you sort of, sort of got an extended festival going on into the World Cup as well. So my sense is you know you, the occasions to consume will be far more and which is why I think it's probably not a bad time to even be looking at something like a United Breweries or United Spirits. Uh, anything that is discretionary linked to entertainment, it's probably not a bad time to be buying it right now because you're on an extended summer in terms of sport and cricket is a religion in India. So it gives you the frequency of consumption. So I think volume growth should be okay. Remember, United Breweries did 16% volume growth last quarter. Uh, and it's not even the, one of the strongest quarters for UB. We are in summer right now. So I wouldn't be too perturbed. I think overall consumption needage is... So I don't know how much demand has actually slowed down vis-a-vis -vis liquidity impacting inventory at the back, back end and, you know, people not having stock to sort of sell. Well, management you know, haven't like, said that. They probably won't optically say it, but uh, let me give you the classical example of something like Bata, which was probably even one of the stocks of the year last year. It's exactly doubled in the valuations have gone north of 40 times, which is plus one standard deviation than it's ever traded. Even in the blowout quarter that it had in Q3, wholesale actually degrew for them. It was the retail side that it okay. So I think, you know, this, this entire liquidity crisis that emerged uh, post-September of last year, I don't think we've seen the end of it. So I, you know, if, if you were sort of, you know, on a 100% scale saying how much is demand vis-a-vis -vis how much is the issue because of liquidity. Uh, I'm not able to put a number on that, but I don't think we're in as serious a demand slowdown environment as, being, as is being made out is my sense. The fact that Lever was still able to eke out a 7% volume growth on such a high base, I was not too perturbed by it, to be very honest. You know, people said there is a slowdown and I'm, you know, thinking as on that kind of base, is 7% really such a bad number yeah, after all? In, in fact, uh, if you go by the historical data of the volume growth, the double digit volume growth which they posted was also coming on a low base mm -hmm. because of Demon and GST. And I think uh, Lever's uh, presentation clearly highlighted there is some bit of slowdown when it comes to, uh, we, India doesn't get that unemployment figure, but the rural wa wages have been falling. Probably that could be one of the factors and rightly mentioned by you, I think the liquidity crunch which is there because of NBFC so keeping all that in mind I don't know if it's been blown out of proportion or the demand environment is weak or not the sort of correction that one is witnessing in the FMCG space is it because of uh, can, uh, would you expect little bit of uh, derating of the multiples because these were the stocks which were going up and the valuations were commanding a premium so there are two parts to that I think if you see the last five years and one of the biggest achievements of the Modi government uh, has been the way they've kept inflation in check and, uh, you know, uh, it actually surprises me that they haven't spoken more about it because it's actually a phenomenal achievement compared to the UPA2 regime. And that's worked in the favor of most FMCG companies. And if you see Lever, the margin expansion in this tenure over the last five years has been phenomenal. At 23%, it's sitting at a multi-year high. And Lever has given you 30 out of 31 quarters of marge, actually operating profit margin growth. I don't know, that's, that point just gets lost on people and eight years he's given you a sales and profit growth. Yeah. Contrast that with a Dabur or an Imami where you see gross margin declines, there are quarters, you see EPS declines, that has never happened for Hindustan Unilever. I think there's a reason it commands uh, okay. the multiple that it does. Now to your point on valuations, I think it's, it's, it's a legitimate point. If you see from the 52 week high, something like uh, a Godrej consumer and an Imami are down about 50-55%. Davar and Britannia would be down about 30% apiece. But the real stalwarts that are still trading at about 40 times, Britannia, Nestle, Lever, United Breweries, are still trading north of 40 times. So uh, to the earlier point that was being made in terms of how much more of a valuation reset can be done, I actually think the entire FMCG basket is approaching a buy zone. And uh, I would actually go out and buy because regardless of whatever form the government comes into, I think the thrust is going to be pro-consumption. Okay, hold on to the thought, Rahul. We want to quiz you more on that as well. But since we're talking earnings, there's a set of numbers that have come out and it's resulted in the stock 
uh, come off Karnataka Bank. The provisions fell about 60% in the March quarter over the same period last year. A lot of people have now made a habit of looking at what's happening on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Gross NPS and net NPS too declined marginally, but if you look at on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, the profit after tax was down about 56%. Uh, let's talk about how the quarter went by and what could happen in the quarter ahead. MD and CEO Mr. M.S. Mahabaleshwara joins us right now on the show. Good having you, sir. Thanks much for joining in. Can you sum up the quarter? If I look at on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, the asset quality is improved marginally, but by and large, uh, bottom line numbers down, NII being down at a time when some of your other peers have managed to grow NII. What's happened here and what could the way ahead be like? Yeah, as you rightly pointed out, even though there is a dip in the operating profit and the NII, and also to certain extent uh, the NIM, the profit uh, zoomed to around 11 crores to 61.73 crores. And annually, it has grown at a rate of 46.57%, from 325 crores to 477 crores. Mainly on account of the fact that uh, the slippage has come down. And as a result, uh, the NBA provision also has uh, drastically come down from around 1,084 crores during the last year to 763 crores during the current year. In addition to that, uh, last year we had one of uh, income, that is the interest income on the income tax refund of around 98.41 crores, whereas uh, the corresponding figure for the current year is 17.21 crores. That is a difference of around 81 crores. And added to that, there is some salary escalation also during the current year. Last year, we had made a salary provision of around 13 crores. And the negotiation is going on with IBA from the entire banking industry. And when the current year, the salary provision is around 61 crores. That is a difference of around 48 crores in the expenses side. So that is the main reason why our operating profit has come down. And and uh, of course, if you net it off, then the figure would be on the expected line. And that is why the net profit has shown a, a considerable improvement. And the most satisfying thing is uh, the asset quality. The gross NPA during the current uh, e, uh, quarter, it is at 4.41%, uh, whereas the net NPA is 2.95%. For the full year, the last year, uh, it was at 4.95%. So from 4.95, uh, uh, so NPA from 4.92%, it has come down to 4.41%. And uh, as far as the net NPA is right, uh, sir. from the last year's 2.9%, it's improved. Yeah, I can understand that, sir. Now, a couple of details. Yeah. Uh, we'll make it a bit of a rapid fire of sorts. You've classified Island FS as an NPA in quarter three. Uh, What's happened in quarter four and have you upped provisions by and large in quarter four and how does the scenario on asset quality look like for FY20? Last year, uh, December, I mean, December 2018 itself, we have classified that entire exposure uh, as NPA and uh, provided at 15%. This year, I have made uh, an accelerated provision and for the entire exposure, as of now, I have about 54% uh, provision. So an accelerated provision is made for that particular exchange. Okay. And sorry, I, I missed that point. How do you think the asset quality picture looks like for the first couple of quarters at least, if not FY20? Uh, asset quality is improving for I say, entire as I said, my entire portfolio. Current quarter the slippage is the four hundred and two crores corresponding to the previous uh, year, the corresponding quarters of 1,038 crores. And similarly, the slippage ratio is also, current quarter it is 0.80%. Last year, corresponding quarter it was 2.88%. So as a result, the credit cost also, last year, corresponding quarter, we had 1.25% credit cost, whereas it has come down to 0.40%. And uh, Asset in the pipeline also, as being measured in terms of the SME2 and MSME dispensation. So last year, uh, uh, we had uh, 421 crores in the SME2 portfolio. Now it has come down to 168.41 crores. 
Similarly, in the MSME dispensation, uh, uh, latest that is uh, sequential, 224 crores as of uh, December 2018. Now 145 crores right. as of March 2019. All right. so I should uh, say that the asset quality is moving in the expected direction. Okay. So two questions. One, um, whether or not this quarter has seen a uh, bump up in terms of uh, uh, recoveries. And uh, the other part of my question being, uh, you know, do you have an increment in your uh, NPL watch list? Do you have any accounts uh, that this quarter has been put on a watch list for you? Yeah, see, as far as the recovery is, is uh, concerned, so current year, as I said, uh, uh, the addition is 400 and uh, current quarter, addition is 402 crores and the recovery is 292 crores. After the cash recovery and upgradation is 133 crores and the technical write off is 158 crores by providing fully. Whereas uh, in the corresponding quarter last year, it was the page was 1038 crores. And and the reduction, I mean, upgradation was 446 crores. With 295 crores cash recovery and upgradation, and also right of, technical rate of to an extent of 150 crores. So that means uh, recovery is on the expected line. So and, uh, as a result, what happened, our uh, uh, the uh, capital adequacy ratio, which was at 12.04%, has also improved to 13.17%. And for the current year, we have also recommended uh, a dividend of 35 percent. Because last year we had declared a dividend of 30. Uh, we had proposed a dividend. Last year we had declared a dividend of 30 percent. This year we have proposed a dividend of 35 percent for our share. Okay, we will leave it at that, uh, Mr. Mahabaleshwar, and all the best for the quarters ahead. Thanks so much for taking the time out and joining us. Well, that's one more banking MD, but the stock is under more pressure now, 5.5% lower uh, as we speak. Um, so not looking all that great. In a bit, by the way, the markets have come, come off, off too. Yeah. Uh, about 68 odd points right now for the Nifty. In, in a bit, we'll also get in the Skamit prediction for uh, the, the, the prediction number two or round two of the predictions about what the monsoon could do. And let's see if that is uh, a dramatic pull or shift from what uh, the earlier prediction was as well. So that's something that we watch out for. I think the IT has taken a knock. It was trading in the weak territory. Nifty IT is, by the way, a top sectoral losers, but stocks like Tech Mahindra, HCL, and also your heavyweights like TCS and V have seen some bit of cuts down. Uh, I'll take the next question from the IT pack. Cognizant has lowered the guidance for this calendar year. What did you make of that? And overall, what's the outlook? Once again, I think we're entering that territory where rupee is depreciating again. So we have a very contrarian view on the IT sector, which we, my head of research, Girish, had put out about uh, six months back, where we're actually calling for a 0% growth in FY21. So I don't think anyone on the sell side is anywhere remotely close to that. Uh, the sell side consensus is assuming a high single digit or a low double digit uh, growth for IT as we enter into FY21. I think somewhere in those assumptions is an implied estimate on the US GDP, which will probably grow at about 2.5-3%. Uh, while the sell side analysts may not explicitly write that, uh, our sense is that this is uh, come July and this is going to be a decade of, uh, this is going to be 10 years in terms of the US expansionary cycle, the longest it's ever been since post World War II. Uh, and I think one of the things that is getting lost on people is that there are a lot of client specific issues emerging in BFSI. TCS has highlighted it, Cognizant has highlighted it, Infosys has highlighted it. For some people it is in BFS and for some people it is in I. So I think there are issues there and I think the manufacturing vertical for all these companies is going to see a massive reset on the way down because of the trade war. And I think what you're seeing today in the IT sector is perhaps the beginning of the realization that it is probably going to be a little more protracted than people are anticipating. Our own channel checks when we've met these companies post their results, uh, they say that a lot of these semiconductor business that they have got over the last two or three years is very China centric. So, and that is going to be a very big piece of the puzzle if this trade war sort of continues in any material way. Uh, if you go back to, you know, the period where the rupee depreciated from 38 all the way down to 60, you will find that there was no material uh, outperformance of the IT index as such. Even in the post Lehman crisis, the IT index was down about 53, 54 percent, which tracked the market. So I don't think rupee trailwind 
from a I don't think you should be buying IT for rupee depreciation but any which ways they always hedged most of their uh, they are exposure. Uh, but the the point I was going you know the point I made with respect to the uh, mm. the FMCG argument also is that you know if if you look at the currency depreciation on the last five years of the Modi administration annually it's been about two and a half percent contrast that to the second term of Dr. Manmohan Singh it was about six percent so if your inflation is low, your currency depreciation is also going to be lower. So you're not going to have as much of a tailwind. Incremental. In, absolutely. So I think that big period of earnings uh, of a rupee depreciation is probably behind us if your inflation is going to stay where it is. So I don't think it is advisable to go overweight on IT. At best, if you feel that there is too much uncertainty in the world and this is a sector you must be in, it's probably equal weight. And within that, I'll probably play HCL Tech as probably my top bet because we're slightly contrarian on the way we're looking at the IBM deal. We actually think it could be earnings accretive rather than return ratio diluted, which is the view that the street has taken. All right. A few other stocks that are moving about, aside from a Delta Corp that we've already highlighted quite a number of times, it's up about 8.5%. Praj Industries is moved up 8.5% right now. You've got the likes of an Adani Power, 6.5% higher. Manapuram Finance, and I mean, highlighted that earlier on, it's up about 6 odd percent following what Muthut has been doing. And a Gothrich Properties, finally you're seeing some green shoots building up after the stock went all the way to 960, came right back down under 800, and now it's making its way back up. Well, it's time now to take a very short break right on Countdown. We've got lots more lined up on the other side. We talk about the Fab Four stocks of the day. At 3.15, we get to the dealing room check and some closing strategies as well. Stay tuned.